Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. Today we're going to drop in another video because I didn't have as much time as I wanted to prepare the real series we're doing, but we're coming back to something that was left unfinished. To some of you, this development kit might look familiar because we did some work with it a while ago. Uh, too long ago. We were trying to test out this little inverter module, the EGS002 uh, PWM driver board. And it's just a little PWM driver board. It's made to drive some uh, NMOS FETs. So allegedly it can handle a few hundred volts, though both I and a few wise commenters have been continuing to drop some hints of you know, little issues they've seen with this board and other inverters based on it. Um, and what I wanted to do was, well, actually we originally planned a video to poke at the corners of what this can do, give it some reactive loads, some, actually test some of the voltage regulation that seems so great when you feed it a light bulb or another largely resistive load, but when you really start to give this thing a reactive load, like an inductive or capacitive load, we'll probably see the uh, power quality diminish significantly. Now. I'm going to make a bold statement here, and it probably doesn't matter, because if we're honest, almost everything connected to mains is driven from a switch mode power supply, which could handle 144 volts DC or 120 volts DC just as well as it handles 120 volts AC. So if it's a pure sinusoid or some modified sine wave, I, I really don't know if it'll matter for 90% of what a person would want to power. Of course, there's always that last 10%, the equipment that really does care about power quality on the input. At any rate, uh, the plan for today is to use that in combination with uh, either the electronic load or some resistive loads with a heat sink, or we have a couple inductors that we wound to use with the system, though we can also just use them as an inductor um, to carry the load current and just see how this PWM board responds to having some wacky loads. Okay, this is a very familiar lab setup. We have the inductor that we wound specifically for this inverter dev kit. Make sure to check out the previous videos in this series. I'll make sure this is in the same playlist. Uh, up top, you can see a resistor bank. We're using one of those one ohm resistors for a current shunt. So one volt will equal one amp on the oscilloscope. And we have that uh, set up appropriately so that it looks correct on the oscilloscope. So we're going to dive right in and see what we see. To mention how the power is flowing, it, it starts off on the left of the frame where it comes into the black and yellow wires on the power input. That's the DC in. There's also a low voltage DC input to power the controller. Of course, the EGS002 does its magic and, well, it's not really magic, does its switching to chop that up and the output filter smooths it out, turns it into a sinusoid. Uh, that's coming out through the current shunt, so we get both voltage and current measurement, and passes through to the load. We're starting with a, a light bulb. Let's start with a reactive load. This LED light bulb has been used in the past because it has a very non-linear current compared to the input voltage. And you can see, yeah, that's true, though it's a light enough load, the voltage waveform isn't visibly distorted. Switching over to the resistive load, the simple incandescent light bulb. This is a 60 watt, by the way. Um, we can see that it looks exactly how we'd expect. The voltage and current are in phase. There's no real distortion. This is pretty much the best case for an inverter like this. All right, I've changed the setup a bit. We've added our two and a half millifarad inductor in series with that 60 watt light bulb. So now we have some real resistance plus about J1 ohm for a, a reactive impedance as well. So that's J omega L where omega is 2 pi F and we're at 60 hertz. Yes, I was expecting a bigger difference here, but I guess uh, it is a pure inductor and 
the resistor is a much bigger player. I would just connect the inductor on its own, but we'd have about 60 amps flowing through the system, given the J1 ohm. So, yep, uh, not gonna do that. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure something would give way, but I was expecting a bigger difference, so we'll need to try something else. Okay, this time for sure. We have the electronic load that we designed a while back, a uh, shout out to that video series. This is a Reve version, so it's a little older, but eh, it's still pretty good. At any rate, uh, we have that combined with an AC to DC power supply. In this case, it's a pretty cheap one. I'm hoping it's awful. It has no power factor correction. I suppose we're about to find out. Uh, if we see a load curve that looks too resistive, we'll just need to switch to a different power brick until we find one that is reactive enough to really distort the output voltage. I'm hoping that we can use this combination to find a weird load level where there's some uh, non-ideal interplay between the inverter module, the EGS002, the power supply, and the electronic load. So uh, yeah, let's give it a try. To reiterate, the main complaint that I was seeing in the comments that stood out to me was a lack of this module's ability to compensate for reactive loads. That would be, you know, recognizing that the output voltage is no longer sinusoidal and then modifying the lookup table or the sign table to compensate for that so that it becomes sinusoidal despite the irregular load current. That's very difficult to do. It requires a lot of computation and it doesn't seem to be doing that here. Though, as we continue to turn up the output power, I'm suspecting it'll be more apparent. But when you look really closely at the tops of those uh, voltage peaks, you'll see they're burdened a little more than you might expect. I've turned the power up to around 11 watts, and that's what you're seeing on screen at the moment. Starting to see that uh, peak of the sine wave get flattened a little more. With the load turned up to about an amp, so now we're at 19 watts. It's weird. This is almost becoming more sinusoidal as we turn the output power on. Uh, it probably switched from a discontinuous mode closer to a continuous conduction mode. I'm guessing that's the difference that we're seeing here. I'm not totally sure. I'd need to tear this thing apart to see how it really works, but it also doesn't really matter. We can see there's still a reactive element, though now the sine wave does look a lot better. Our final stop here is 26 watts into the electronic load. Now our output current almost looks triangular with a sinusoidal input current. And yeah, it's it's looking, looking pretty good. Uh, honestly, a little bit too good. So I guess we might need to try something else similar. I, I think I have an idea. I actually recently bought an e-bike. So we'll hook up that e-bike charger, which pulls about 100 watts into the battery packet. The ch charger is super cheap and just feels way too light for the amount of power that goes through it, so I'm guessing it's not power factor corrected, and we'll see some really cool nonlinear currents. Okay, I almost feel like the EGS002 is laughing at me at this point. I've been trying to demonstrate how bad it is, and it just keeps being okay. I, I can't describe any of the behavior we've seen so far as bad. It's handling some pretty challenging situations. Like there's basically a load step halfway up the sinusoid because of the nonlinearities of this e-bike charger. And it's handling it phenomenally. I know we're tripping over current protection after a few cycles, but just single shot trigger the scope. And yeah, this isn't even only the e-bike charger. We have the e-bike charger plus the LED light bulb plus the other AC to DC power supply connected to the electronic load. We have all three of these connected in parallel. Of course, the dominant player will be the 100 watts going to the e-bike charger, but the sine wave looks okay. I'll be as bold to say that that's probably about as good as you'll ever see from the wall, at least in the United States. That looks on par with what I would expect to see from the wall. Is it a perfect sine wave? No, but neither is what the utility company delivers. Of course, like at the utility company, I'm sure it looks great, but then you had all the transmission lines and the losses and all of your neighbors turning on their HVAC and your heaters and your ovens, and it's just not as simple as a pure sine wave. 
I don't expect they're doing any wave shaping or, or any complex uh, modifications to the sign table to accommodate for these reactive loads. Maybe just simple closed loop regulation at each voltage set point, uh, something like that would be reasonable. But let's put this in perspective for a moment with just a basic 300 watt DC to AC inverter that someone might buy to use in their car. Let's take a look at the signal quality that we're seeing out of this inverter dev kit and compare that to like a bottom of the barrel, cheap as you can get it, um, inverter module. And it's pretty obvious to see that this is worse, <laughs> a lot worse. It's a square wave and it doesn't really matter what load we put on it, it'll still be a square wave. So, you know, is our other, is our dev kit a pure sine wave? Well, I don't know, it starts as a pure sine wave, but it ends up being a little deformed. But does that, is that better than what we see here? In almost every case, I'm, I'm guessing yes. Yes, it's probably better than, than something that doesn't even try. It is conclusion time. Okay, is the EGS002 magic? No. Does it do complex wave shaping algorithms to make sure the sine wave is never without a disturbance? Also no. Comparing it then to a simpler counterpart, comparing it to this other inverter. Comparatively, it seems a lot better. The output is a lot more sinusoidal, even with a highly reactive load and, and even a highly reactive load that starting to hit the hundreds of watts range. It, seems to be doing okay. That is, the EGS002 seems to be doing okay, at least better than the cheapest inverter money can buy. I think it's safe to say, if you look back at the other videos featuring this EGS002, the comments are pretty negative. They're, they're pretty combative, almost. Um, really criticizing this module for its lack of sophisticated regulation methods. But at the same time, it is by every count and measure better than some commercially available products that can be bought off Amazon or from Best Buy or where, wherever you buy your electronics. Um, so it, it makes it difficult for me to really comment on this. Is like, is it perfect? No. Is it better than commercially available products? Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. I think it really just depends on what you're trying to do. Would I rather this cheap inverter that we bought in the enclosure, would I, would I rather this cheap inverter behave more like the EGS002? Actually, yes. So perhaps where I'm going with this is, should a person be planning to kick off an inverter series in the near future? Uh, there are some limitations that are, are valid criticisms of the EGS002. It doesn't do a great job of establishing creepage and clearance or isolation between different elements like there's 0.1 millimeter spaced pins with no special high voltage clearances baked in that are hundreds of volts different in, in potential. And that's not okay. We need to fix that. So perhaps a good middle ground, if a person were designing the power stage, like the actual power circuitry for a similar inverter controller, perhaps the right way to go about it would be to make a daughter card that translates from the EGS002 to some common form factor that allows for maintaining that creepage and clearance. Using the EGS002 to debug the power electronics and then rolling your own inverter controller on a separate daughter card that you then hot swap into that system. That would allow you to debug one thing at a time, start with a not ideal, but pretty good uh, controller that has some drawbacks and then switch over to a higher power, higher voltage, more controlled, maybe higher quality inverter controller that, that we can drop into that same power stage. I don't know, could be a good middle ground. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. And yeah, I, I look forward to picking this up, should we ever. I think we've learned a lot. You look back at the previous two UPS projects, you look at this inverter series and, and we've learned a lot about designing inverters. And that really has been the weak link of our UPS projects. So should we pick this up again? I think it'll go very differently and a lot better than it has in the past. Sometimes it's great to do something else. Like we were planning to keep going with the DMX series for a while, but one thing led to another and a couple of those videos actually took quite a while to prepare and edit. Um, so just, 
needed to do something that was a little bit easier, a little bit uh, less preparation um, for this video. So went back, picked up that old series and finished off something that we meant to do a while ago, but the uh, video just got scrapped because our footage <laughs> wasn't very good. <laughs> Didn't really tell a story, it was just all over the place. I mean, all of our videos are a little all over the place, but this one was a little bit too much, yeah, even for me. So I wanna give a special thank you to all of our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step that you've taken to support us directly. Seriously, thank you. I also wanna thank Anyone who supported the channel in any means, whether it be liking, commenting, sharing with others, or just watching, uh, it, everything that you do really helps to keep this channel moving forward, and it's been really humbling and exciting to watch the community grow. So, thank you. Most of all, I hope you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So, thanks for watching it for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!